Ed Dutton, welcome to the Gauntlet. Are you ready? Yes, I'm. I, I'm fascinated to try out this weird, pretentious uh, <laughs> attempt to be different that you that you that you have uh, you, you have going this year. I'm. I'm neither afraid to be different nor pretentious. And well, no, I mean, your, your, I like your shirt. Is it's, your shirt is not pretentious? It's very lumberjack. True. It's very, yeah, it's very Michael Palin. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. You yeah. know, lumberjack song. This is how this is me pretending to be working class when I've never done a day of manual labour in my life. <laughs> no, there's something about your accent which tells me you might not have done. No, no, but... I'm, a, I'm but a weak programmer, sadly. Round one. Which topic do you fancy? Music, you already showed me. You already showed me those three. We 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 went through the format before the start of the show, but I will let you choose change your mind if you if you think that the questions for cosmology. Didn't, didn't take your fancy. Yeah, I thought they were silly, and um, I don't know. Is those are those are the, those are the three? Because it would be good if one of them was history or something that I actually. There's a history up. topic later. There's we, we'll go through six rounds. All right, let's so. go. Let's go. For, let's go for music. But I should emphasize the only thing I know about is Iron Maiden. <laughs> well, let, let's limit the discussion to Iron Maiden then. What, what is it? The Trooper, uh, Run for the Hills, all that. That's the kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's they're, they're well they're both from the early albums, but yeah. Okay, so it's um, also, also tune is a problem. Don't know what that is. Live music mm -hmm. is more important than recorded music. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, some music genres are better than others. Mm. Ah. Oh. All right, well, let's do live music then. Live music is more sure. important. Take it away. Uh, do you, by the way, do you want to argue in favour or against that? I shall so, argue in favour. Go ahead. Uh, only, only in so much as this brings back my, my anthropology days. So 20 mm -hmm. years ago, when I was uh, a PhD researcher at the University of Aberdeen and the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and uh, one of the things that I was very interested in was the concept of communitas, which is the mm -hmm. idea that uh, in a, a phase of change, uh, the way that society copes with that change is by having a ritual where you are the, the society as a whole is brought together and um, via normally via music, uh, the, the 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 sense of self is is broken down through a kind of hypnosis, essentially through the the, the beat of the music and the beat of the music kind of uh, it, it it creates this sort of oscillation inside you and it uh, which which causes you to rise up above yourself and uh, you you lose your sense of self and you merge into the sort of Dirk Hymian collective, um, and then you and then you bond together as a society and you feel this sense of oneness. Uh, and then that goes away again. And it's considered very important to having a united society that there are these rituals, that these collective rituals of, of communitas, uh, which, uh, which, 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 which create that dissipation of self uh, into the collective. And there was, uh, there was uh, God, what was the name of the research? Was it Arnold van Gennep? I can't remember which one it was. But he specifically looked at... Uh, um, uh, 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 pop concerts in, in it might be Victor Turner um, in in the modern day as an as a modern day example of something very similar to collective communitas. The point of it is that you bring the society together. Uh, they are um, they, it, it makes it easier for them to absorb the lyrics, and the lyrics are normally to some extent related to the religion or the ersatz religion of the society. Um, uh, and uh, and and then the people absorb the message of the of the of the religion collectively, uh, and they have this this sense of shared self. This where where normal social structures uh, break down in the liminal lim in Latin border, um, in the in the in the in the liminal phase. So you you move out of everyday life into the liminal phase. A pilgrimage is an example, and it could be argued that to some in a in a if we really want to stretch that comparison, then live music involves that. It's this collective catharsis um, mm -hmm. and that you can't achieve that with with uh, with recorded music because um, uh, normally you're on your own. And that even if you are together in a in a in an arena or something and it is recorded music. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite the same as live music. The the effect on the person's mind. There's been studies on this. The the the, the impact on the, the the degree to which it hypnotizes you is not the same because it's not quite authentic. It's not. It doesn't quite have fidelity. 
Um, and so there is this sense in which live music um, works better and also creates a, a sort of a connection, a bond between the musicians and the audience and so forth, because it's, it's so it's like the difference between being perhaps in a cinema and being in a theatre. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, on that basis, that is my argument for why live music is more important than recorded music. Do you think there's a sense in which listening to a live concert, so the, the opposite, instead of uh, watching pre-recorded music as a collective, you are experiencing a collective recorded moment. Can can you um, in some way buy into the com commutas? Was that the word? Like, communitas. Are you, part, are you part of the communitas experience, even if you are, say, a fan watching a concert after yeah, yeah, to, to some extent, over. yes, to, 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 to some extent you are, but it's not as intense because it's not, it's not, I mean, for a start, it's not appealing to all of your senses, it's only appealing to two of them. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and secondly, you're not physically there. If I give you a recent example, uh, you may have what I was in Liverpool uh, a few months ago, when was it now, December, uh, and I was at, uh, on the road up to Anfield. And the atmosphere, it's just incredible. I mean, it was really mm. extraordinary atmosphere. Now, had I watched mm. that on television, as, even as a Liverpool fan, I wouldn't have got even I wouldn't have got 10% of that. So mm. I think there's there's something about being there that you 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 become absorbed in it and you and you you lose yourself. You become one mm. with something that's extremely important about actually being there in person. It, because it's all encompassing to all of your senses. So if everybody within a single city or or most people attended a a single event they can become part of this communitas together but of course it's impossible for an entire nation to come together into one one space so is is there a, a sense in which the ability of pop music in, in fact we're seeing this splintering now but it used to be the case that a, a large number of people would be listening to the same radio station for example and therefore in a sense, entering into a show. Into it, yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and I think it it may well have, well you did have the Baltic Way. I don't know what what percentage of Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians joined hands in the in the in the Baltic Way. Quite a large number of them, so all together doing this this thing. But but um, no, I think that's true. I, it's a very good point that people that are born after about I don't know the year two thousand or after the mid nineties can't quite understand that everybody or almost everybody in the country would be united. There was a degree to which we were united and new by radio and by television um, in a way that we hadn't previously been. And that, that's gone now. Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's gone. We were, it, was a, it was a nation uniting, uh, just kind of thing that, uh, uh, not Ernst Gell, no, what's his name, uh, Benedict Anderson would write about, imagined communities and all this, that it, 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 it had the capacity that you know, everybody would watch the particular episode of Coronation Street or everybody and everybody would talk about it. And it would only be weirdos like my friend Tom at school, whose parents were too middle class to have a TV that, mm -hmm. that, that, were, that, that were left out of it. You know, we all watch Harry Enfield's television program in the mid nineties and we'd all come in the next day doing the impressions. Uh, so that's something that has gone, that uniting factor. Uh, I suppose there are certain exceptions to it, like the queen dying, um, but even even then, you can watch it on all kinds of channels. Whereas if you go back uh, to when Princess Diana died, everybody either watched BBC or ITV, and that was the lot really. And so it had this it had this communitas. It's an example of communitas. But I would say that it would obviously be much more intense to be there, um, either in one of those queues outside the supermarket to sign the book of condolence that they had at the time. Or to be there at Buckingham Palace, where it was the flowers and apparently the, the smell was this, uh, overwhelmingly pungent and all this, and so 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 it would and so so um, but yeah, the, the, it, it did have a uniting factor that has now that has now gone. I mean, look at me now on this this uh, this YouTube channel, and there's so many yes. thousands and thousands of them, and this just wasn't something. This wasn't a possibility as recently as twenty years ago. It's a it's an experience you have in the UK quite often. You go to a house and there's a piano in the corner. Nobody plays the piano. It's become a piece of furniture. Um, and actually, people these days give away pianos. that You can't even sell them because there's such a glut. Uh, but I guess this is a leftover remnant of a time when music had to be performed live, you know, before <clears throat> record players and before radios. So do you think the existence of live music, which has probably brought more 
and higher quality music into people's lives than ever before, but has uh, removed the experience of uh, relying on people that you know, musicians in person performing before you. Do you think overall this has uh, been a, a good or a bad thing for music consumption? I've just I mean, I mean, I suppose you could say that it, in to the extent that we used to have a small number of radio stations that played this music, and this music could unite the society in some way yeah. in these rituals of communitas, and we'd all wait for Thursday. Was it Thursday night at, uh, at seven o'clock? Top of the pops, and oh, and, yes, then, yeah. and then and. And then you'd get you'd you're probably too young to remember, aren't you? But but you but you'd 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 you'd, you'd wait for go through you you go through the top you know the 30, 20, 10, whatever, and then number one and all this, and then they play them. And uh, and it was uh, that that would have been a nation uniting uh thing. Um I suppose that uh, it, it was on a, or it it for it made people socialize together in a in a way that they're socializing beyond the kind of royal family sitting in front of the telly and talking kind of way. Um, and, 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 and there probably was some bond, bond, bond created uh, via the live music. Yeah, for example, my great grandmother apparently, could, my grandmother's mother, could play the piano, and um, mm -hmm. and she couldn't read music or anything. I think she barely read, but she 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 somehow taught herself to play the piano, and she was very good at it. And people would come round, they they they'd play they play live music. Actually, thinking about the the evidence of the increased effects of live over recorded music. And um, I never heard my dog start howling in response to me playing Iron Maiden or whatever. But if uh, I played my electric guitar, which I had when I was a kid, and I'm not saying playing uh, it badly either, I just played it. He was yeah. talking, ooh, 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 really? saying, the, the live oh. music was wow. a bit different for him than the, uh, the, than the recorded music. Yeah, yeah, the, the embodied sense that the music is coming from a person rather than out of the ether. Mm, yeah, he thought I was. He thought I was. A, he thought I was a wolf, and I was. I was right. uh, howling, and for, for others, others to join me. Well, let's bring that round to an end. I'm going to give you nine nine points for that. Uh, an excellent, very commendable score. And let's go on to the next round. Would you like to talk about ethics, history? There's your chance to talk about history or metaphysics. I'll talk about history, please, Luke. Religion is the most potent force in shaping civilizations. Based. Revisionist history is necessary to understand the past. Based. Or women in history have been systematically underrepresented. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. I mean, this is like being back at university, where you, this is like humanities degree level stuff, isn't it? Where you have yeah. to define your words. Well, I so, say that you are free to define these terms however you like. I'll well, no, that's, 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 that's you, ludicrous because you, you just define you, them wrong. If, well, if you define it in a way that I um, think you're cheating to give yourself an easier time arguing, then you'll lose points. So, Religion, hang on, religion is the most potent force um, in shaping civilization. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll do that and I'll disagree with it. Sure. Well, the idea that it's the, the it's the most potent force. Fine, let's 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 be you know undergraduates in the early two thousands and define the word religion. And I choose to define it in the conventional way of the collective worship of a moral god. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll define civilization in the in in the of of, of the, 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 the the certain structures that people normally agree are the essence of civilization, such as writing and um, tall buildings and things like this. And I think that it's it's a balance. It's not the most potent. I think it's the, it's a balance between the two, between between mm -hmm. reason and religion, which is probably quite important. Um, and uh, religion is extremely important in so much as religion tends to take that which is evolutionarily adaptive and make it into the will of God. Um, and that means it makes into the will of God being things that make you positively ethnocentric or indirectly cause you to be positively ethnocentric, such as patriarchy, or uh, which means that it reduces into male conflict. And so you have more possible cooperation and therefore you are, are, are more um, united front against other groups that will destroy you and therefore you defend civilization better. So so religion it does that. Um, uh, religion um, tends to it tends to help to create larger polities. Uh, if it's the collective worship of a moral god, uh, then it it it, uh, it goes beyond the mere tribe and those that are related to you and who you know personally to a broader group of people. 
uh, who you might not know personally. And religion, the idea that you believe in the same moral God becomes the insurance policy that you should cooperate with that person. And so therefore you can create a larger polity, a more diverse ethnic, uh, genetically diverse polity, um, and that polity then allows you to throw up, uh, because the genetics is larger, uh, geniuses by random chance, let's say, and then geniuses tend to be the motors of civilization and come up with amazing stuff that helps you, helps to develop civilization further, and also comes up with weapons or whatever that helps you to destroy those that try to destroy your civilization. Um, um, certain religions, I mean, I guess the ones that that uh, that don't do this die out, uh, then then become the, uh, central to the civilization. You could argue that with neo Thomism, this idea that the purpose of science is to unveil the nature of God's creation, um, and so and so therefore you have to have this fundamental belief in truth that God verifies things as truth. If there's no religion at all, if there's no belief in um, uh, in, in eternity, nothing to strive towards, um, nothing greater, then you just become decadent. Um, you, well, and, and once you start, uh, you, you, you have nothing to live for, you have nothing to strive for, you, you, you lose interest even in truth and in the pursuit of truth. Uh, and, and we see that when religion collapses in societies, um, the, the, everything is questioned. Everything, everything evolutionarily useful is questioned, and then the society just falls apart as it has done in the absence of of, of, of some kind of religion holding it together, um, into um, in, into just decadent chaos. But really, into the worship of the self. It could be argued that having a god there stops us from being narcissistic and stops us worshiping ourselves. It could be argued that having a god there makes us more pro-social and there because we have someone on our shoulder telling us to be good, and therefore we uh, we, uh, we we are more cooperative and that helps civilizations. So there's all kinds of ways in which yes, it is the motor of civilization. But then the opposite way of looking at it is that religion is involves dogmas, it involves truth assertions, it involves taboos, it involves all kinds of things which are the enemy of truth, it involves certain things which should not be questioned. And it could be argued that what the religion, ten, what the genius tends to do is shake things up, is question whatever the, the dogmas are of the time, whatever the truth claims are of the time. And therefore, he tends to get into trouble. Um, and, and so in a time where it's Christianity, he's questioning that. And in a time where it's wokeness, he's questioning that. And so it seems to me that too much of a, of a, of a religious discourse is bad for civilization um, and, and can bring it down or can stop it developing, where, but whereas too little of it is also bad for civilization. There has to be, I think, some kind of balance, which is quite hard to strike, where um, there is a religious core such that you have all of these positive things that come from having that religious core, but it's not so uh, uh, dogmatic that it stifles creativity and therefore stifles the development of, of civilization. And on that basis, I would say it is not the most potent force in shaping civilization. I say it has to be balanced other things. How do you think religion is shaping our civilization at the moment? Uh, well, that I suppose that raises a question, um, a, a really kind of pathetic undergraduate question of how do you define religion? Um, be well, yeah, because you, you, we, you included woke in your answer. As, as well, as I did. Yeah, I suppose. Course. I suppose what I would say is that you can have a, you can have a, in any definition you can have a kind of core to it, mm -hmm. and then you can have deviations from it, which in a metaphorical way can be brought into that core. I think you can talk about there being the religious core, the religious bundle, the, the group of adaptive um, traits which are brought together under under religiosity, and what we see now is a deviation from that, where we have um, things like wokeism, which are which have some elements of religiosity, such as dogmas, to a very pronounced degree, um, but lack others, such as the belief in a metaphysical universe or redemption or, or, or whatever. Um, and so um, in that sense, you could argue that they are a movement away from that adaptive form of religiosity. Uh, and the, but anyway, they are very, they are very, very bad for civilization because they place heavily uh, uh, dogma above the pursuit of truth. Um, and in, in much the same, you could go back and you could say, well, there's an extent to which if you go back to the early 19th century, there was a degree to which you had a, a forms of religiosity then that placed dogma uh, above the pursuit of truth, um, uh, uh, particularly in the universities, that you had to be a practicing and confessing Anglican in order to be involved in the universities. And it was only when they removed those dogmas and they opened things up, when they liberalized a little bit, 
um, that, that, that then you, you have the flourishing of the universities and it also correlates to some extent with the flourishing um, of genius um, and, and so forth. Uh, but what, what you have now is the breakdown of one form of dogmas. The dog was based around religiosity, which tends to be a group oriented thing. It tends to take being group oriented and make it into the will of God. So you have th that's broken down and you have a replacement, which is basically being individually oriented, being selfish, being almost a solipsistic, that you are who you say you are. You are a spark of divine light. I am that I am. I, I, I define who I am. But really, we've made ourselves into gods to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. And that becomes the thing that you can't question. And there would be this period, this, op this optimum between the two, where one dogmatic form of, uh, of dealing with the world, religiousness, group oriented, is, is on the decline, and a new one is on the up. Um, and I think there was this balance between the two where we had optimum freedom, and I think you you see that in a lot of creativity, a lot of creativity uh, across the 20th century. But at, at the beginning of the 20th century, we were still a religious society. By the end of it, we are, we're becoming uh, this set, this sort of ersatz religious society, this Gnostic society, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and but there was this period of optimum creativity between the two. So again, I think it's this balance that's necessary. It's like the balance between... Uh, Raymond Cattell argued between uh, being an open and a closed society. Charles Popper goes on and on about oh, the open society, the open society. Well, if you're too open, then everybody's too different from each other and you become balkanized. But if so, it's not a bad thing. But if you become if you're too closed, then you sort of stagnate and you're not open to new things. And, 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 and so that's a bad thing. And it's this it's this balance between the two that probably has to be struck. Is there is there a sense in which the drive towards truth as as an absolute necessity versus uh, the desire for other more emotional, more cooperative things is a gender divide. Is there a, a male versus female? Uh, this isn't directly related to to the. Well, if we follow Simon Baron Cohen's uh, model, and there does seem to be some empirical truth in it, then yes, the stere the stereotypical male brain is autistic. It is it is highly systematic, but it is empathy blind. And the stereotypical female brain is highly empathic, but it is system blind. Um, mm. And certainly, and certainly, if you look at um, uh, research on, or even just just uh, surveys with women, they are much more prone to putting the importance of equality and particularly harm avoidance, basically feelings and people's feelings not being hurt, safety, things like that, um, yeah. above freedom, and therefore above the pursuit of truth. Whereas men are slightly less inclined to think in that way and are perhaps more inclined to put truth above hurt feelings and above safety. Um, and so we, we and as women become more dominant in the society, and more influential in the society, we have seen this shift because these women uh, should be basically running a nursery school. That's what they're evolved to do. And um, instead, they're running a society and they've left their stamp on it such that uh, feelings are pl and people's feelings not being hurt and equality uh, and a sense of being wanted and validated and all this stuff is put above the pursuit of truth. And you see that in the university. Uh, it's put above, certainly above safety, above freedom. Uh, and you have to have freedom in order to be able to pursue truth in an unfettered way. Um, and then it's most extreme. You get schools now that have abolished playtime just so that unstructured play just so that kids can't possibly get bullied or left out. And you have this, this narcissistic generation where everything is done for them and, and they don't really have to think for themselves and, or, 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 and they're not, they don't come up with coping mechanisms to cope with bad things happening to them. Um, and they're praised unrealistically and told how wonderful they are and bad, and bad things never happen to them. So they think they're wonderful. And they get older and in the real world and bad things do happen to them and they can't cope and they become hostile and they go bonkers. Um, snowflakes. Uh, and so, so yeah, I think that the women are women are less interested in objective truth. They're less interested in systematizing. They're just less interested in these things than men. They're more interested in empathy, in people feeling nice, in in hurt feelings. And there's been a dramatic rise since the year 2000 in the use of feelings words in representative corpuses of British texts, and a dramatic fall in analytical words. Consistent, I think, with uh, with women coming into positions of power. You remember when I was a kid in the 80s, there were apart from Mrs. Thatcher. There were basically no women in positions of power. No women judges. There were no. There were no. There, there, there were hardly any women MPs. There were no women. Hardly any women lawyers. It was all men and Mrs. Thatcher, and we liked it like that. 
<laughs> the, the, the reason I asked was because was, you, you had this uh, dichotomy between the religiosity versus reason within society. And I, I wondered whether the, as you were describing, the, the reason oriented male brain and then the, the less systematizing, more empathic female brain mapped onto those two instincts. But, but, but perhaps it's a slightly different, slightly orthogonal. Um, well, um, there's reason and there's systematizing. Mm -hmm. So you could you could distinguish between the two. I mean, you can get a person mm -hmm. who is high in systematizing, but for yeah. various other reasons, such as, I don't know, neuroticism or uh, 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 psychopathic traits or I don't know what, is, is, is sucked into a broadly irrational system. Mm -hmm. So you get these trad Catholics, for example. You may have come across them there. And they and yes. they you know, they're, oh they're trout Catholics so they're, they're they're perfectly autistic and whatever but they ex yeah. just they have they accept certain dogmas it's like they want what they want on a plate a kind of a kind of uh, um, cook's holiday um, <laughs> right. uh, you, you know, they, they they don't want to have to think for themselves they want they want to outsource that to somebody else you know they oh, want okay. a package a package holiday identity. Yeah. Um, yeah. a, a package holiday means of making sense of the world with all the questions answered, um, served up to them. Um, and they don't think beyond that, but they are interested, they are interested in the system, they want systems, mm -hmm. but either they're not intelligent enough or they're too neurotic or I don't know, whatever, um, to look past those those dogmas. So, this mm -hmm. distinguish between a person's interested in truth and unfe unfettered, and a person's interested in. In, in something that calms their nerves by seemingly making sense of the world. Those are separate things. Whereas I think that women are more inclined to just not care about uh, systems, that not care about a systematic understanding of the world and, and just be more concerned with how everybody feel. Well, uh, another outstanding discourse. I'm going to give you another nine and let's go on to the next round. Um, cinema and theatre, world affairs or epistemology? What do you fancy? I'll have world affairs, please. All right. Uh, your three options within world affairs are uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a debt trap for participating countries. Populism is a delusion. The, the thesis of our friend, uh, academic hey, hey. of course. Um, or a global elite shapes world affairs. I do. I'll go for populism as a delusion. Um, um, although that is quite a similar question to a global elite shapes world affairs. Um, I, do, I, I, do, I do think that there is uh, some truth in that, that, that he's right about that, that populism is a delusion. And I think that he, he presents a, a, a very reasonable thesis on this, which is that uh, again and again and again and again, uh, an organised minority uh, is able to control a disorganised majority. And there are so many experiments. I don't know if he looks at that. I can't remember. But there are so many experiments which demonstrate that to be the case. That the a, a very small as well, a very small organized minority, if it is more intelligent, uh, if it is more higher in general factor of personality, uh, i.e. more socially skilled, um, uh, uh, is, and if it, if it is more fervent even, is able to take control of the majority. And you can look through all of the so-called populist revolutions of world, you know, world history, whether it's the, the uh, Reformation, uh, whether it's the uh, French Revolution, uh, whether it's the Russian Revolution, uh, whatever it happens to be. And you can see again and again and again, although it might be presented as the masses rising up, that's not actually the reality at all. The masses are unintelligent, the masses are disorganized, and they need to be led. And they tend to be led by a counter-elite or a disillusioned group within the elite, um, or whatever it happens to be. And if you look at the research by Peter Turkin, then what he shows, Turchin, throughout, throughout history, again and again, is that it's an organized minority that will take hold of the, popu of the populace um, and um, will lead them uh, into what seems like a popular revolution, uh, but which is not, is actually a, a fight within the elites, whereby um, uh, the the... Uh, those that are in elite positions will create a coalition with the populace of a certain kind and will use that to attain power. And we're seeing that at the moment um, very in very stark relief in the UK, 
which is why I think in the last week, uh, um, the prime minister is so worried. Why is wh why was it worth getting up and on the day after George Galloway was elected to Parliament and doing this rather desperate speech where he was mm. basically saying, if you vote for anything other than Conservative or Labour, then you're an extremist. Because the concern is that you have these various counter elites, um, th those on the far left, Jeremy Corbyn and George Galloway and whatever, who have created a co who are basically ripping apart Labour. Labour's coalition is up middle class champagne socialists, snobs, whatever, uh, virtue signaling idiots and foreigners and, and in particular Muslims. And that's their coalition. And 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 he's and he's he's uh, on their own they can't achieve much but but led by people like Keir Starmer they can and he's pulling apart their coalition by taking away the Muslim component of it which means they lose power and then the other side is what he calls the far right well their coalition is basically the more conservative among the elite plus the white working class uh, and that's also taking people from. Both, well, both from the Conservative Party and also from the Labour Party. Um, and so it's it, on, on both prongs, it's dangerous. It's dangerous for, for, for the system continuing as it is. But it only goes to show that what you portray as a revolution is actually uh, a coalition whereby the elite managed to persuade, managed to gain the support of people, you know, basically protection rackets, really, uh, get, get people to come behind them and then uh, leverage leverage um, uh, power um, in order to take control of the apparatus of government. And so I don't I don't I it, clearly if populism is defined if populism is defined in in the as in the pejorative way of um, just appealing to the masses. If that's how you define populism, you'd say, oh, Nigel Farage is a populist. Well, it's not a delusion. No, that's just that's a fact. People that but you, you do get people that appeal to the masses, and they are populists uh, as opposed to, and, and they use uh, you know Donald Trump or whatever, and they use these these uh, often charismatic techniques to do so. And there's a certain style to how they operate. And whatever. Fine. Populism is not a delusion. It's a, it's a real thing as distinct from elitism or or whatever. But if you're defining it in the way AA does, the populist delusion, the, IA, the idea that revolutions emerge from below, there may be some truth in that. I mean, I think that the movement towards individualism partly emerges from below in so much as it is caused by a change in the genetics of the population due to weakened Darwinian selection pressures. So in that way, it emerges from below. Um, mm -hmm. But in order to have a place uh, uh, in in politics and bring about a revolution. That these people have to be organised and they have to have leaders. Um, and, and so it's more complicated than just oh, it just all bubbles up. I mean, even someone like Watt Tyler in the Peasants' Revolt was almost you know this was the pop. This was it was a highly educated. He was a Tyler. He was a skilled craftsman, uh, lead lead leading the rabble. Um, and that's what you need, someone organized and whatever. And he wasn't skilled enough and he ended up getting killed. So, yeah, I would I would I would I broadly concur populism is a delusion. But I would I would temp, temper, temper that with saying that there must be some element of of a change in the nature of the of the of the of the populace uh, in order for there to be like a fundamental shift, let's say, between, you know, towards individualism or whatever. If the concepts that populists are appealing to, that that we the people, the majority can take control, almost a de democratic urge of um, it should be from or like of of the people, our rulers should should comprise the ma majority. If if that premise is is fundamentally flawed, why do people use the populist messaging? What what's the purpose of somebody like? Trump, uh, is it that he has fallen for the delusion, or is there a different instrumental purpose in speaking? In oh uh, yeah, you want you want to make people feel that they matter. So to to, to hold, to, I mean, I've talked a lot about these moral foundations uh, um, in my book, for example, my book "Breeding the Human Herd." We are we are we are pack animals, but we have to rise to the top of the pack, at least in prehistory. Uh, in order to be more likely to pass our genes, in order to have more resources. Um, and so we have the group-oriented foundations of obedience to authority and 
uh, um, in-group loyalty and sanctity versus disgust. And we have the individually oriented foundations of equality and harm avoidance. And you have to keep those in balance. Um, and if you, as the big man, as the despot of your little tribe of Bushmen, uh, allow allow a situation where the, the 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 people further down the hierarchy don't feel looked after, don't feel cared about, don't feel they have anything like a, a reasonable share of the pie, um, then eventually they may get together. A leader among them may emerge, and they may overthrow you and kill you. So mm-hmm. it's very it's very good to make those people feel that they matter, make those people feel they're important, make the inspire those people, tell those people that they really really matter, um, and 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 therefore to tell them that yes, you are part of a movement, and that movement is going to do this, and you are and you you and you can you can gain a sense of uh, of accomplishment vicariously. Uh, via the accomplishments of your your lord, basically, in the same way that people in medieval protection rackets would gain a sense of accomplishment vicariously via the accomplishment of their lord at the at the joust or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so I think that it, it's just good politics in order to, it, that you keep people on board, that you appeal to them, that you appeal to what they want, that you make them feel like they matter, that you make them feel like this is them doing this. And they're therefore more likely, if, you, if and when you need them to, to make sacrifices on behalf, on behalf of you and to fight for you and to do things that you might need them to do. So it's very important to get that balance right and therefore to tell them that, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah, democracy. Whereas in reality, if democracy delivered something we wouldn't, what we didn't want, then we would, of course, get rid of it. As indeed, uh, there are many attempts to do, or at least to, to, to limit it or to interfere with it. Yeah, I mean, that fear that oh, if, if I don't appeal to those people, they may go off and and organise and, and take over. That almost is populism at that point, isn't it? That, that fear is the fear... Of a populist uprising. Well, except that, except that the way that a lot of people frame populism is in is in this unstructured manner, whereby for reasons we don't quite know, they just uh-huh. sort of collectively come together and rise up, like an emergent, like ants. You know, right, but that's not the... that's not what happens at all. It's probably not even what happens with ants. What almost certainly happens is that is that there's some traitor or whatever you want to call him among the elite who uh-huh. who leads them, um, or. There's a more there's one of the more intelligent members of them that gets together and 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 leads them, but there's some elite organisational component to it. It's not just some idea that we have this whole this whole idea that Steve Turley goes on about about oh just breed them out oh yeah the the, the conservatives are having more children than the the liberals and so eventually we're going to see a conservative backlash. No, that doesn't it doesn't work like that. What's much more interesting is that among the conservatives, I'm sorry, among the more intelligent. The big predictor of breeding is conservatism. That's the interesting thing, because hmm. that really does augur a future in which the elite will flip back towards conservatism, and therefore society will. The fact that uh, lots and lots of uh, low IQ people are breeding and have conservative views doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 that things will change back. It's interesting your stray comments about the ants. Do you think emergence in general is a concept that's pushed f- for sort of pro-democratic reasons? I don't know, but I would have to read more about ants. So I'd have to read. I, I did. I did start reading E.O. Wilson's book about ants, but I got bored. But um, I, I wouldn't be at all. There's definitely a hierarchy among ants. There's there's hierarchies among ants, and ants are sort of slightly different from each other and and whatever. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if if when something like that happens, when they just decide that the queen has stopped laying eggs, so yeah. it's kill her. An eater. There is actually somebody who made that. There's call. probably some slightly more socially dominant ant hmm. that, that that as it were makes the first move, and yes. then and then others follow. But I don't I don't know about that for sure. I have to look into it. In the same way that in the army, I'm I was talking to Adam Perkins. You know Adam Perkins, the author of the um the um the welfare trait, uh, an academic, mm-hmm. and he said that there's this thing I didn't know about this. It makes sense really. Called fracking. I don't mean fracking in the environmentalist sense. Uh, where uh, if a bunch of men come to the conclusion that their commanding officer is no good, then they'll just get together and kill him, like a mutiny. But, yeah, but they'll so they'll just kill him. But so but exactly a mutiny. Someone has to take charge in a mutiny. There has to mm-hmm. be the Fletcher Christian type. There has mm-hmm. to be that kind of person. It's not just going to just suddenly just happen where everyone just thinks collectively, let's kill him. Someone is going to. That's a more. That's why apparently the Japanese in prisoner of war camps. 
um, they would um, make a point, I don't know exactly by what method they did this, of working out who among their prisoners was what they called the king rat, i.e. the sort of socially dominant charismatic type. And they just uh -huh. remove him from, uh -huh. from, the, from the rest of the prisoners with the result what was that no prisoner rebelled him. Because you wow. needed the king rat, even among a bunch of people of the same rank, a bunch of privates or whatever. You needed the king rat to mm -hmm. to to organize the rest. Well, I'm I'm giving you another nine. Um, you you're going extremely strong through the gauntlet here. I think it's time to move on to the next round. Would you like to talk about psychology, elite theory, which we've sort of already just been talking about a bit, or theology? Well, I have a theology degree and doctorate. But I've studied psychology for the last sort of 15 years. So um, yeah, you're a real split here. Uh, I'll do psychology, please. Sure. OK. Social media is psychologically harmful. Nature is significantly more influential than nurture or addiction is a symptom of societal failings. Um, I'll do nature is significantly more influential than nurture. The classic. And which side are you going to be arguing? I'm going to argue again. I'm going to argue that it's. Um, no, it's I'm going to argue against it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I mean, basically, it's an incompetent question. And <laughs> if, if 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 this was if this was or an incompetent statement, if this was undergraduate level, that's what they want you to do. That's that would be the first. That would be what you get you the first. The two one would be to just argue one way or the other. It's an incompetent <laughs> statement. Because okay. what element of nature are you talking about? So uh -huh. it, 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 you, you can break down human uh, traits uh, into those which are highly genetic and those which are highly environmental. Mm -hmm. And so among those traits, obviously, it's a tautology, something that like intelligence is a point eight heritable. So this means it is very strongly a matter of genes. Genes are 40% of the variance. It's, it's highly, highly heritable. How intelligent you are, yeah, N uh, nurture. And if nurture, by the way, are, are we defining this as just, as, as, as just um, the environment in general or specifically how you're brought up? Because if it, I, I th yeah, I think environment. Let's, let's okay. Well, then that's this. even more incompetent question because normally, <laughs> normally the word nurture implies being raised. You know, your parents nurture yes. you, or we are yeah. we using nurture. Some people say, oh, if you want to cook a nice scrambled egg, you have to nurture it. Right. I mean, <laughs> looking, look, look, looking after it or something. You know, I mean, if we if we yeah. take it in the way that nurture is normally meant, i.e., you're raising somebody, then very, very limited element of intelligence would be that. I mean, it would have to be outlier things like being really badly and physically abused so that you get brain damage. Um, e yeah. um, even, um, even not having the right nutrients or whatever as a child has a only a small effect on intelligence. But the big environmental component is that you have an intellectually stimulating environment as an adult. That's the that's the that's the big uh, the component of it. I suppose you could say that as a child, um, the the environmental element as a child is more important. Yeah, because it's your parents that are creating the environment, not you. So the heritability of the environment becomes uh, a heritability of intelligence becomes much lower when you're a child because it's it, it's your parents that are creating the environment and they could be more intelligent or less intelligent than you, so they could be retarding you or they could be pushing you to some maximum and then when you get older and you start creating your own environment consistent with your own innate intelligence then the heritability rises to point eight um, and and uh, and so and then you you know you either do or don't create an intellectually uh, stimulating environment to, to, to varying degrees. So with something like intelligence, then yeah, the heritability is uh, na uh, nature is much in adulthood anyway. Nature is much more intelligent than nurture. Now with something else like um, height, then the heritability is much lower. Um, it's 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 about 0.6. But still, nature is more important than nurture. Nature is more important than nurture. But then with some um, uh, human traits, nurture is much more important than nature. So an example would be sexuality. So the evidence is that among men, the heritability of sexuality is 0.4. And among women, the her heritability of sexuality is 0.2. 
So female sexuality is overwhelmingly environmental. It is as environmental as intelligence is genetic. Uh, and mm. if you put women in certain environments, then they will become lesbianicious. Um, so, so that is an example of something that's extremely uh, environmentally plastic. That's why most women that go into prison become lesbianicious. Uh, the, the theory is that, that they're evolved to be parts of harems um, and, and therefore to make uh, um, all allo parents with a small number of, of, uh, of, of, of women whom they very strongly bond. Um, and th there's a lesbianicious element to those bonds in the absence of men um, because the lesbianiciousness helps to create strong bonds and thus more successfully bring up the children. So that's very poor. That's very low. So it really does depend on the trait. Now, overall, meta-analyses have indicated overall, if you take all traits together, the average heritability is 0. 0.5. Hmm. So on that basis, nature is significantly more influential than nurture. It's just a, it's an empirically incorrect statement because it's about the same. If you take all traits together. When you say um, all, all traits, does this not depend on how you choose to categorize them if you if you break down a certain subset into more distinct traits it will weigh more heavily well possibly but i don't i don't i can only that, that may well be the case but i don't i don't know to, to, to how how much you can break it down i mean of, of my understanding is there have been detailed meta-analyses of this that have looked at thousands and thousands of traits um, and that and that overall roughly about 0.5 if you if you said to me what's the heritability of i don't know uh I don't know, lip, lip thickness. I don't know what yeah. the heritability of that is. So if I said 0. 0.5... But you'd guess 0. 0.5. I'd probably, you know. So so, um, so on that basis, I think the statement is, um, is incorrect. Um, the statement is incompetently phrased. The statement is confusing um, because, as I say, are you talking about environment or are you actually talking about nurture, as in the raising of a child? Um, uh, and... Uh, yeah, so I don't, I, I've, I've, I've I guess na nature, nature and nurture is the, the kind of classic f phrase. It's the, um, on the street, people talk about nature versus nurture, whereas it sounds like in academia, the, the more precise term is heritability. So well, the, yeah, it's heritability, her it's, well, it's, yeah, it's genetics versus environment. Yeah. Um, and, and an element of that environment is childhood environment. And I, I would see childhood environment as nurture. Um, the, yeah. um, the evidence is that childhood environment really does have a, a very small influence on psychological traits. Hmm. Um, it will That's influence... from what people... I mean, maybe it's as a Freudian um, effect on society, but people think of um, pathology often in terms of uh, trauma that you suffered in your early childhood, don't they? The, the, the reason that person is has that personality defect is because of what their uncle did to them, etc. Right, but there's, a, but there's a heritability to trauma and mm -hmm. that heritability is mediated by having a certain uh, personality type or a certain personality disorder. And mm -hmm. so to understand the actual effect of what you'll get, you're going to get some people whose uncle... Um, uh, sexually abuses them and, and they'll they won't traumatize them at all and you'll get others yeah. that are traumatized and there's a strong genetic component to whether you suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress or whatever that's mediated by whether you have a, this personality disorder borderline personality disorder for example and also if you are if you have a disorder like that you're more likely to be abused um a, because of the heritability, so you're going to be surrounded by people that are either it crosses over with being psychopathic, so you're going to have like psychopathic relatives, um, mm. and, and B, because of just the way you behave. And so, on, um, on it's, um, if, if it's you just, it's, 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 it's broadly incorrect. Once you control for all the relevant controls that you need to control for to make the empirical statement, then no, ch mm. ch childhood does not have a big effect on these things. But as a, as a, terminological question if you say that a, a trait is 0.6 heritable is that without any controls at all so this is not uh like a twin study where you it's twin study take... no it would oh, be a twin okay. study so, so in which case like the twin uh, a twin study where in which both twins have been raised in a different the, environment the best, the the best kind are identical twins raised apart 
Mm. Um, and, and and it's on it's on those that you can get the, the best stuff. Uh, failing that, just identical twins allows you to work out what's gone. It can't deal, deal so much with childhood, but with childhood, then it's identical twins raised apart. And what we find is yeah. that the, it does childhood does not seem to make much of a difference. And they all the, the, the identical twins end up really rather similar. Genetics wins through. It's they're, they're, they're just are not that many identical twins. And then even if they are raised apart, they're probably raised in relatively similar back you know in, in terms of the the broad scope of human experience that's so true then also us. then also you can look at things like racial adoption studies so you get uh -huh. you get um you get people that maybe they're maybe they're 50 percent the same and one's raised by the black family and one's raised by a middle class white family and again the differences don't end up being much in the end mm -hmm. you get you get you get the wilson effect which is that the genetics become more and more and more pronounced as you get older it wins through over environment as you get older so there might be a difference when they're 18, but by the time they're 28, uh, you, you will have got a regression to the mean among the, the one that's been adopted adopted by, you know, a white vicar or whatever. <laughs> and, and I'm going to give you, I, I have to give you 12 points for that because uh, it's just a, such a um, complete and expert answer. I couldn't, you know, this is the highest score. Oh, is it out of 12? I assumed it was out of 10. Oh it's God! I must have balls up. I must have balls up the other ones. Christ, you. Jesus! It's that's not like... out of twelve either. It's uh, it's a it's a completely flexible scoring system, giving me scope in future years to you know grade inflate. Is 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 what I'm going for here? Oh, I see. So it's, yeah, so it's, it's like arbitrary. like the, like the English is nobody's education. ever got a twelve before. So you know, oh right, jolly good. Consider that a, a record being set of sorts. Um, should we go on to the next round? Right. Technology, natural sciences, or Christology? <laughs> um, I'll go for Christology, please. Your, your. This is your chance to break out that. Uh, break out. Break that out that. Stuff. Break out that theology degree. <laughs> Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus' resurrection was more important than his ministry. Or Jesus is subservient to the Father, and I guess you can choose whether to answer this. Oh, this is um, such based on your own opinion, or if you prefer, uh, according to sort of um, a religious code. That you take okay. Oh no, I'll, I'll go for the middle, the middle one, please. Go ahead. So, okay, would you like to middle. argue in favour or against? I, I, I'll say it's more important. Yeah, go ahead. So um, what do you understand? It, it raises the... Oh, God, this is such a fucking undergraduate bollocks. Like, it, <laughs> it, 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 ra it raises the question of what do you regard as important? So yeah. do you... I, I would say, surely there is nothing more important than your eternal soul and what is going to happen to it. Because yeah. you don't want your eternal soul to go to hell for eternity. Because eternity is a long time. Mm. I mean, if you imagine, Luke, like mm -hmm. a ball a hundred times the size of the sun made of iron okay. yeah, that is brushed by the wings of a butterfly once every <laughs> two million years. <laughs> then by the time that ball has been ground down to nothing, your <laughs> suffering will have barely begun. Right, wow. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a long time, Vivian. um, and so obviously you don't want to go to hell. Now, Jesus's ministry, he 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 showed some miracles. You know, he showed that he was he he was imbued with the Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. he said some nice things about about the poor being rich in heaven and and all this sort of thing. He created a community, but ultimately, you don't want to go to hell. What rescued us from hell was Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. Like that's what rescued us from hell. He was crucified for our sins, yeah. thus purging us of our sins, making it possible for us to go to heaven. And then he was on the cross. He descended into hell rescued all those that were already in hell, gave them the chance of redemption. He then ascended into heaven, rescued all those, you know, whatever, with the father, whatever, and then came back and 
set up his ministry, which if you follow his ministry, by which I don't mean his ministry when he was alive. I assume, by the, by the way, we mean his ministry, you know, when he was alive. Yeah, okay. um, and, and, and set up his followers who can then offer us that possibility of redemption, which we will receive if and only if, in a Protestant perspective, um, we cleave to Christ. So from a Protestant perspective, Jesus' resurrection, which was the only proof that he really was the son of God, and that he needed to be followed. I mean, we needed that proof, and that was the proof. Then is Jesus' resurrection is far more important than his ministry prior to his resurrection from a Lutheran or Cal a Lutheran perspective. So I'm, I'm answering this question from the perspective of you know of Arminian yes. theology. From an Arminian perspective, uh -huh. that's my answer. In a way, it's a it's a softball question, isn't it? Because, as you say, um, the 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 ministry can have lots of positive effects, but when there's infinite value infinite. on the line, one way or another, then it's it's gonna yeah, exactly. Like, it, who cares about him talking about the the lilies <laughs> and the in the field, and then them not having to worry about things? Who, who cares? So what? It's much more important that he's rescuing your immortal soul from hell. As so, an aside, um, I'm, I'm interested why you went for a theology degree. What, what was it that pushed you in that direction in the first place? Well, I did three A-levels, English literature, history and Christian theology. And when I started the Christian theology, we were doing philosophy of religion. And I found this so fascinating. I've got to remember that it was at Catholic schools. So there was a kind of a rebellion kind of aspect to that. Uh, but I found this so interesting. Yeah. The, 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 these arguments for and against the existence of God as a 16 year old, 17 year old, right. that I just, and I just decided, no question about it. Very quickly, I came to the conclusion that theology was my most interesting subject. Uh, uh -huh. And so therefore, I decided I wanted to do a theology degree. And were you, were you convinced by the arguments or, or no, not, not at all? You were, you were completely convinced by the counter arguments? No. Well, oh, um, I, I, no, no, I would say that the, 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 the model of God is probably logically refuted by things like the problem. It's very hard to get around the problem of evil using, um, using that kind of uh, purely logical. I, I, I can see I have some sympathy for the sort of William James argument that you should force yourself to believe this thing, even if it's a lie, um, because of or you think you know it's not really the case because of the positive consequences of so doing. I have some sympathy for that uh, that kind of argument. Um, if I believe in civilization and the importance of civilization, and I've just mm. said to you the importance of God and the importance of religious belief a social and eternity, yeah. then at the very least, I want other people to believe in God, even if I don't. Mm. At the very least, I want others to. And so, isn't that rather hypocritical? Shouldn't I position. force my try and force myself to do so? Yeah. So, so. Um, as an ethical question, then, if you think that belief in God is important for for the good of society, um, even in a even in a conversation like this, in a, you know, in a public platform, um, could you could you ethically persuade yourself that you ought to pretend that you do believe in God? so as to influence other very people. interesting question it's a question i've asked myself with regard to a book that i'm just about to publish um called woke eugenics um oh, in which yeah. i argue that wokeness is a selection event and and ultimately it's a eugenic event um and therefore shouldn't it be the case that i should pretend that i am woke and promote right. wokeness because of the good that wokeness will ultimately do to, to purifying the gene pool um i struggle with that but but yeah i can i can see I can see your point. Yeah, uh, perhaps you, I should do you, that. You have a very, I, I detect at least a very deep, almost intuitive um, ethic of truth seeking. Like you almost can't stop yourself, but pursue and say and promote things that you've kind of uncovered and believed to, to reflect reality. And that almost then comes into conflict with the, the more generic idea of the you know, good, good or for the good of humanity that might require you then to lie. Mm, yes, yes, and 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 also though it could be argued that 
uh, that's another argument perhaps for the existence of God, which is you say, well, if I believe in God, if I believe in truth, well, why is truth so important? Oh, well, because truth is important to negotiating the world uh, adequately. What's the point in negotiating the world adequately? Uh, 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 well, uh, 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 so that I can live. What's the point of living? Um, and it, 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 ra it raises these sort of ultimately metaphysical questions. Why are you so concerned? Isn't it sometimes good to lie? Don't we know that there's evidence that we get selected to, let's say, believe in God or selected to overdetect agency because it's good? It's good to be wrong. Uh, as a sort of like a like a like a like a fault like an over like an over over uh, sensitive smoke alarm. So why yeah, it's not inherent yeah. truth isn't inherently good. So what 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 is it then for you that is so important about the truth? Oh well, I just want to understand the nature of the universe. Well, what well well what what verifies it as eternally true? It it raises these meta. Um, well, I don't know. Well, doesn't it have to be a god or something something eternal something eternal to motivate you? To, to, you have this fundamental belief in truth. Um, it, it's it's a dogma. Um, doesn't there have to, doesn't there have to be some sense of eternity, some sense of calling, some sense of a, of a calling to know the truth? And doesn't that imply that some sort of caller? Doesn't isn't there implicitly a religion behind what you're saying? Um, mm. And and then there, 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 there may be some truth in that. Yeah. Do Do you believe in in an objective morality? Is there an ought in the universe or out of the universe? I I I I I think that left wing people are evil. That's my uh, fundamental. How do you? Is that axiomatic or? Um, no, it's just that's it. I don't. I'm not. No, that's just my personal belief, and I find it offensive that you question it. <laughs> well, I'm very used to people thinking. Well, so. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I'm joking, but I don't. I don't. Um, no, I. I mean, a lot. Honestly, I. I don't think there's objective morality. No, I think morality is evolutionarily informed and is is yeah. is basically i think ian uh, eo wilson was right when he said that if uh, um ants could talk or if uh what was the it wasn't ants what was the example he used anyway some of some kind of social insect um then they would just dress up as the more objective morality the stuff they do mm. you know and 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 that that that, that, that would be the stuff that they do which is evolutionarily adapted and they would say that the that, that, that termites that was, it, that was the comparison he used um that they would they would just say that's that's morally what we do I think that's true. Mm. So, so your um, your having been persuaded by the problem of evil is, is that a case of viewing God as a self contradictory concept rather than yeah? I don't, I don't, I don't God think as described in the Bible conflicts with your existing belief in a, a moral system. The, the God as described in the Bible is not the God in the Old Testament is not really the same God as in the, in the New Testament, and um, and so th th this this idea and this idea that you, you would have I suppose that, that you just have to you have to bow down before God and accept what He does and that, accept that He knows better, and maybe you know what you see as evil is there's actually some deeper reason for it and you don't understand it. That would basically be how they would respond. Mm -hmm. um, it's not logical, no, it's not meant to be. I mean, the whole point of the Trinity is basically to say it's logical. How can the Trinity logically make sense? The point of it is you say, I am submitting my logical faculties. I am seeing, I'm submitting to the community. I'm showing my, my intellectual subservience by adopting a dogma, which is obviously impossible. Um, and and, and um, religion always has elements of that. And you have that in wokeness. You know, dogmas that are obviously impossible, like complete environmental determinism or whatever, that just fly in the face of reason. Well, as much as I'd love to keep discussing this, I, th I think looking at the time, we're going to have to call call the round to an end. Yeah, I've got I've got to go to I've got to go to got I've got to go to Lidl. You've got have you got time? I think we've got one more round, but I can we can make it a sixty second burst. Well, I'll go in the car. Right, okay, come on. <laughs> okay, let's make this a super hyper speed round. Do you want literature, software, and mathematics, or eschatology? Literature. And would you like which one of these do you want? Um, well, again, children's literature is as complex and significant as adult literature. Yeah, do you want to pick that? 
Yeah, okay. And you've got 60 seconds, and then I'll give you a score. Okay, right. So it's it's it's, it's not as complex in terms of its in terms of its syntax, in terms of its sentence structure, in terms of all kinds of things. So in that way, it's not as complex. It's not as complex in terms of its plots, in terms of all kinds of things. It's not as complex. The significance of it that's something that's measurable. You can measure how significant children's literature is compared to adult literature, the influence on the culture, and that's been that's I think that's been done to some extent. It's it's not as significant. It's not generally uh, as influential. Uh, on the culture. That certainly is a testable hypothesis. That's a testable hypothesis, and I don't know the answer. That's a testable hypothesis. But it's certainly not as complex on, on that measure. On, on, I, 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 it would be hard for me to think character development. I can't think of any measure on which children's literature would be as complex. The question is, where did you live in children's literature, adult literature, borderline areas? Right, that's roughly my summary. I, I, I might change the format so that it's a 60-second answer for all the rounds, and we could just blast through all the guests. I'm giving you a 10 for that, and... Uh, here's the high score table. Those are the contestants you're against. Let's find out where where you rank. Yeah, oh, you you're blowing them out of the water. You're it's like, it's like star in a reasonably table. priced car. <laughs> it's exactly Top Gear's format. So, thank you so much for joining me, Ed Dutton. And uh, yes, I, I it's a pleasure to talk to you. you maintain your. Uh, hope you maintain your dominance for the rest of Lambster. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Bye bye.